sense of an increasing amount of archaeological data resulting principally from the PPG 16 um, guidance. Um, much of which was being accrued in the rural areas of South and West Yorkshire. Um, infrastructure works, mainly to do with the A1, and of course associated development. So it was an area where there was regular archaeological intervention. Now because of the mineral extraction elements in this area, it was possible to make a very good case for requiring aggregate levy funding uh, through English Heritage for what turned out to be a five-year project to collate and synthesize the raw archaeology over a very wide area. The project ended in 2010, effectively when we, we published uh, the book. Uh, the findings, I think, are ge generally still hold. But of course, a lot of work has been carried out since then, perhaps not as much as it might have been, probably not been for the recession, so I've bought some time there. Um, but I am aware that as, as, as time is moving forward, some of these the ideas we had have, have been slightly modified. And I will introduce some of these to the, tonight as, as we go along. It's a, it's a two moments. Sorry, it's good. <laughs> if you, if you no? Try pressing the down arrow on the keyboard. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, that's better. Um, the project covered an area of some. 1,500 square kilometres um, from Weatherby in the north uh, to Dinnington in the south. Uh, the proposed study area originally was meant to be more focused on the magnesium limestone, Got the, uh, the blue line here. But, um, the requirements of the National Mapping Programme um, kicked in and it was de 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 decided that we would take in a much larger area of the um, Sherwood Sandstone to the east um, because there was a hole in the, in the programme there and they wanted to fill it. Now this, this was, this meant we took in a bigger area of, of the margins along the limestone which we intended to originally. But the inclusion of this large tract of sandstone was in fact quite fortuitous in helping realise one of the principal objectives of the project. Now, the idea of the project, I suppose, initially crystallised following the M1A1 link road work in 2001. Um, we've done a lot of work there on a landscape to the east of Leeds, which enabled us, probably for the first time, to start looking at landscapes rather than sites, and developed a model for uh, the incremental development of crop mark complexes, which saw sites created as small hubs of, upon which they would expand and gradually field systems would develop around them. Now this, seemed, this obviously held quite well for the recent leads, and I think we could extrapolate it as a model to cover a lot of the limestone area as far as the Don. But it didn't work to the south of the Don. Um, and it certainly didn't work on the show of sandstone, where Derek Riley had uh, identified the, the, uh, the long linear, rectilinear field systems, which he coined the phrase brickwork fields for. So, looking at the wider picture, we hoped to be able to look at where these changes occurred in the landscape. Was it due to topography? Was it due to geology? Or there were other factors involved, soils, perhaps cultural, were there boundary factors to do with um, Iron Age territorial um, implications of Roman frontiers at different times. These are the sort of things we thought we'd try and look at and see if it happens. Um, the types of data we were looking at Obviously, the largest data set was crop marks. Um, we employ three people uh, mapping crop marks, working 
an English Heritage office is in effect in the town of Rowe, um, working with them and using and being trained by them, uh, getting their expertise. But they're, they're actually our staff. Um, the thin soils of the limestone, as you can see, are at the site of called Wattle Syke near Boston Spa, particularly good at crop mark formation. This isn't the case everywhere, and there are visibility issues. Um, and because of that, and because of the large amount of geophysical survey that's being carried out, certainly since 1990, we also include that include geophysical survey that is actually part of these with the crop marks onto uh, dedicated GIS. This, this is a particularly good example of why we need to do this. This is Scorcher Hills near Burg Wallace. On this site, the, it, it's a potted against the first division background. But the field systems you can see there are totally, don't exist as crop marks at all. One of them is totally, totally invisible to air, air reconnaissance. Another example of why we do is now how the two different forms of data complement one another, seen here at a site in Leadston, where certain parts of what appears to be a ritual landscape, a small NG form there at one, do not appear in the geophysical survey, but other barrows here, number number five, don't appear in the crop mark data. So you really do need to look at both together to get an overview. Of course, what we don't see on the crop mark data, or certainly wasn't plotted, not the region photos from in the media group we'll talk about later. And of course, what we need to include in all of this is the excavation data. Although a relatively small data set compared to the crop marks and geophysics, it's uh, Central, if we're going to be able to date and phase these landscapes, and this is what's the companion picture of the other site. Let me just show you the other And we'll come back to that. And of course, these methods now form a suite of, me of investigations which are regularly used uh, on most sites in the country where crop marks give us the survey and excavation evidence all come together <coughs> to enable us to see things like these uh, the round houses here which don't show up um, as crop marks um, but you do get them. the crop marks enable you to focus in on them and uh, the geophysics enhances it and then the excavation informs you now there are problems, of course, with this. Um, visibility is a big problem, and not just a problem in terms of the different types of terrain you're working on. There's, there's, a, there's a period issue. The earlier prehistoric features, such as the Bronze Age House at Alton and the Egypt Palisades of Mine, do not show up in any remote, remote sensing technique. Um, and so the only way things like this are found are through excavation of other sites which are, are targeted because of uh, uh, another, a later cut mark feature or geophysical feature or, or through just random stripping. Uh, the, the, these came up in an area which was nine age enclosure that uh, we weren't expecting. But this means that there's a bias against finding these sort of things in the, uh, with the techniques we use for detection. And typically it is the, 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 the Bronze Age material, such as another site here at uh, South Amsel, which is this, this series of, of forged Bronze Age huts. It's quite reminiscent of sites like Hitler Dill and Black Patch in, <coughs> in Sussex, which um, we don't really see anywhere else in, in the north of England, or certainly in this, this part of Yorkshire. Um, the other element, of course, in the landscape that we don't normally find are these four posters, which a array like this is quite unusual. There's only another one other site, I think, it's not common, it's just probably got more four posters in one place. So, visibility is a problem. The 
For some prehistoric sites, visibility isn't a problem, plus, and that's large ritual monuments. Now, the study area we have, we contain two of the well-known engines of Newton Fan and Freybridge, the two sort of outliers in the group, and colloquially as the Yorkshire hinges. We did go in with the idea that we might try and find more hinges uh, on particular sites of the, on the Don and on the Nid, where, because the pattern seems to be that these hinges occupy riverside locations on the main Pennine rivers flowing into the Bay of York. Now, we're particularly keen on the, the Don site because we uh, live in the study area, but despite a lot of claims from local archaeologists that none of our work was able to uphold the existence of the Hange there. We did, however, find <coughs> some reasonable evidence for one at North Dayton on the, um, on the Nid, and that's on this, this image here, um, which, which creates a much better context than for the, uh, the better known Green Hell Barrow. And on all this information um, was collated in the 1980s through a WEA class, um, Harrogate, mapping um, crop mark landscape, a crop marks held by the North Yorkshire County Council. It, it hadn't come to light until we, we started this project, so that's quite interesting. The one thing I would say is though that we, um, we mustn't get obsessed with riverside uh, locations for the hedges. One of the other things we found is that hinges or hengy forms tend to exist in, in other parts of the landscape. I've already uh, shown you the one at Leston, which came up as a due to the survey on the This is a, another small henge at Burton Salmon. Interestingly, in a landscape which seems to have a number of pit alignments um, surrounding mm. it, uh, this is interesting in the, s the sense that the later phases at Ferrybridge also have pit alignments surrounding them. Um, these pit alignments don't seem to be concentric to the hangs like they are at Ferrybridge, but certainly to find them in the same landscape is interesting. The distribution on the, on the left is um, the map of the round barrows, the ring barrows and hinges that we plotted by the project. Um, the triangles are long barrows, there's not many of those now. They seem to suggest that the ritual monuments are focused on the limestone, but the companion distribution on the right here is a distribution of all prehistoric finds, which suggests that prehistoric, prehistoric activity a little bit more widespread and ubiquitous, and we perhaps should expect there to be barrows in that area. Um, but perhaps we can't see them again because of the visibility problems. Maybe in terms of the form of the barrow, ring barrows are easy to spot. But small uh, burials such as the donations, which are generally just covered by uh, cairns are also going to remain invisible to detection. Similarly, ritual monuments such as the pit, uh, pit circles that we found around Ferry Bridge, uh, with the uh, cremations up the centre in a little four post structure there, aren't going to be detectable. And, and these are only known around the hinges by virtue of the large scale stripping that went on. Um, to facilitate the roadworks. So I don't think there's a um, pit circle found anywhere else in the, in the project area apart from the But so this is a problem, and it's the same post hole problem we've had with detecting enclosures and supplement sites. On the Sherwood sandstones to the south of the Don, to the east of the limestone, it's more difficult to, to find these because of the, even when they're stripped, because of the, the sand-filled features in a, in a sandy geology. 
Um, when Derek Riley did his original survey uh, of the North uh, Nottinghamshire and South Yorkshire study area that he published in 1980, he only identified 13 um, ritual monuments. Um, and this project hasn't actually improved upon that, so you couldn't find any more either. So the, 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 the visibility of these monuments hasn't been increased. In fact, I suggest that it will have deteriorated because of the degradation from crop from arable plowing. The excavations shown here are actually um, two out of the 13 that uh, Derek Riley originally recorded, excavated last year. And um, he wasn't sure whether they were prehistoric barriers, I think, at the time, but I think we can now confirm that these two are and have been dated to, to 1900 and 1700 BC on the basis of the contents of the cremation records. There's a big problem um, generally in this, 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 this area, or probably this region in fact, in, in trying to demonstrate continuity between the Early Bronze Age and the, the Middle Iron Age. There's, there's virtually no evidence. And so it's fair to say this, 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 this project wasn't able to, to inform that any better. I mean, even at sites such as Ferry Bridge, where you'd expect there to be continuity of such a, a focal point in the landscape, there doesn't seem to be anything going on between about 1300 BC and 500 BC. Uh, there there seems to be a major hiatus at that time in the use of the monument. And really, I suppose the rest of this lecture now is going to address the, the Iron Age and Roman landscape, because that's pretty much what the crop marks that we, we've uh, mapped represent. One of the objectives was to try and find evidence for uh, sort of an indication of territoriality in, 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 the, in the area. Um, we've got two major Iron Age tribal units here, the Proratori and the Brigantes. The original, well, the, the, the general, it's generally accepted that the boundary between them was somewhere around the Don area. Um, We have looked um, in that area, and one of the things, of course, you look at is there is defensive sites and earthworks. Uh, the Don does have the, the Roman Ridge earthworks, which look as though they probably are a Iron Age defense up against the Coriol uh, Tobic. Unfortunately, the Iron Age banks of the earth measure earthworks at Grimm's Ditch and uh, Becker Banks don't really conform to any boundaries that are known about. And then to, to explain those, you have to start thinking about the, the sort of sub-tribal groups, possibly, that Brian Hartley and Leon Fitz were, were talking about when they, they were a book on the Brigantes. We have um, two major forts, not in the area, South Kirby and Winker Bank. Within the study area, there's Paraginalmit, and none of these forts have received anything like <coughs> substantive investigation. In fact, not the Paraginalmit. We don't really know how these forts uh, worked with the, the surrounding um, landscape, the field systems, and enclosures. And that's a big problem. It's a problem for the Iron Age, it's a problem for the Roman period, and it's also a problem for the post Roman period. We do have a number of smaller fortification sites that have been spotted. And, um, these are generally termed marsh forts because they're uh, low lying. Um, they often have a succession of defensive ditches. But the only one that crops isn't is uh, Went Hill at um, on top of the Crunchy Fort that existed uh, on the southern, southern bank of the, of, of the river Went which unfortunately as well has not been investigated because it's been destroyed by the Smeaton Lineworks. Um, 
And you may have noticed that um, Michael Wood has recently proposed that it's the site of the Battle of Greenberg, and that's not incidental. Isn't the figure of what I'm saying here? But Norton is, is a really nice site that was a new one that was found through the project. It, of course, it hasn't been investigated, but it seems to look, it seems to appear to have a, an earlier phase of, of open settlement, possibly, upon which the fort has been superimposed. Uh, the site of Potter of Car uh, down here. Again, a succession of fences and looks as though it might have some settlement evidence with it inside it. It's very difficult to make sense of these spatially physically, chronologically, because there's been no investigation of them. But the only site that has been investigated at Sutton Common has um, been interpreted as a, a, as a grain storage uh, site, one of the interpretations anyway, and I find it a little bit difficult to understand that, given that it's, it's not actually in the, the main grain producing area, which would have been on the limestone. Uh, it does remain rather enigmatic to, to the grain. Thinking in terms of Iron Age subgroups, there's not a lot you can look at from the excavated evidence that's diagnostic enough to do anything with. There's very little in terms of pottery and diagnostic finds. So you inevitably turn to the burials. Now, <coughs> up until quite recently, the vast majority of the burials in this area would have conformed to the typical pit burial crouched information um, with the, the, the grave or pit being just large enough to accommodate uh, the individual, not a lot of space. The, the recent work on the A1M <coughs> identified a different type of burial, quite similar in a sense to some that have been found at Leadston in the 1970s, but but distinctly different, really, in terms of that they were burials that had been interred in a, in a very large pit, vertically sided pits, which had um, plenty of room in them. The burials were always to one side. And these were dated to about 400 to 200 BC. And they, they, I think they've probably got lost um, in all the uh, excitement of the chariot burial, which was just found at the same time. Interestingly, both the isotope evidence for both the chariot burial and these all suggested that they had spent their formative years in the north of England, which suggests it's a group that's being introduced to this part of the world. Now, until recently, they were the only uh, examples of this type of burial, but an excavation <coughs> at Darrington recently has come up with a, another similar one same type of pit, uh, the burial in this case um, propped up against the side in a, a more supine fashion, which obviously is not an Iron Age burial rite as we understand it, but the radiocarbon date is uh, again 400 to 200 BC approximately. Uh, no isotope work has been done on this burial, so I can't uh, say for sure what, where its origin is. It, it conforms to the same. as the Micklefield ones, but I think as time goes on, it will be interesting to see how this, this the pattern of these, these burials develops. At the moment, they're in quite a, a tight area around um, for the east of Leeds. There's nothing like it in South Yorkshire, and it could well be that this is a, a distinct group um, that may give us further evidence for, for a, 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 a sort of tribal cultural area. We have to really now just look at the crop mark evidence for, for a bit, indications of this sort of thing. Um, we don't get much uh, evidence for this from the, the sort of circular enclosures because there's so few of them and very few of them are investigated. So there's not enough information really to work with here. But what I would say is from 
what you can glean from the from from the positions of these cut marks where they occur in, in, in rectilinear field systems, they always seem to form the earliest element in the field system. They, they've either been respected by later fields or they've, they've been cut through by them. So I think subcircular enclosures, perhaps also D-shaped enclosures, we're looking at an early prehistoric origin. I think that, that, that fits with what we found in other parts of the country. What we tend to get most of in this area are these um, rectangular enclosures, often with very deep ditches. Um, these tend to be Iron Age in their origin, but often with later sub internal subdivisions, which are our Roman period. Um, the one here at Swillington is quite typical, where the round houses in the middle have been cut through by the, uh, the later Roman subdivisions. One of the um, things I've been thinking of recently is that a lot of these enclosures tend to be trapezoidal in the shape rather than rectangular or square. And this, this was never picked out as being critical in the original study, um, partly because you could explain it by you know, course of aim or, or topographical features. It doesn't have to be badly out of filter to be trapezoidal. But there is, there is a, an area in, around the Darrington area where there, there does seem to be a very deliberate, um, I know the example of one here, a deliberate trapezoidal shape. Um, I've, I've gone back into the data now and I've found quite a few which don't seem to be affected by uh, topography. And they, they often have a, just the one central division. So I, I'm, and we have excavated one like it. The reason I'm also showing this uh, slide is because they, the, what was picked out as being uh, a key type of site were these ones with um, double dip circuits. Now, what, what, what the Darrington site has been excavated suggests is that the double dip circuit is actually not uh, always what it seems and the trapezoidal shape might be actually something real. Uh, this example just sort of overturns perhaps the, the way we've been thinking about things in the past. This is the, um, the site being stripped for uh, Darrington, the, the example um, of, of the large trapezoidal enclosure. It's a huge ditch, up to two metres deep, and back filled with rubble. So, so much rubble, in fact, that you have to imagine the banks being linear cairns, in fact, around the, um, the inside and the outside of the, uh, of the enclosure. Now, this enclosure is Iron Age, but later on it was incorporated into a Roman field system. I think the relic nature of the enclosure, they certainly used the interior, but I think what was left of the banks around the edges and the, the size of the ditch dictated the, the shape of the, um, of the field systems or the new enclosure system, possibly roadways around the edge of it. So it makes it look um, on the face of it as if it's a, a double ditch enclosure. In actual fact, it's, um, it, it's an early enclosure which is just it's so large that it's determined the nature of, of the later regime. There's some more convincing variant forms of enclosures which have very distinct distribution patterns. The two I'm going to show you here are ones with extended entrances, which are the red dots centered around the fort at South Kirby and the area to the, uh, to the east. And the other distinctive group is what's termed extended enclosure groups, the yellow triangles, which only occur in the area between the air and the wharf. Those are the ones with the extended enclosures, uh, entrances, will probably be called banjo enclosures in most places. Um, 
usually interpreted as being associated with livestock management, but I would say that probably every site on, on the study area was associated with livestock and frozen herb management of some sort, whether it's for keeping animals in or keeping them out of the crops um, and allowing for rotation, I think. Most of the Iron Age and the British uh, economies were, were, were based upon both. So I, I don't think we can just say, well, this is, a, this is an enclosure entirely dedicated to, to livestock management. But the, the form of the enclosure is very distinctive, and uh, the distribution kind of suggests that it was a type of enclosure adopted within a certain area. These um, Extended enclosure groups, or what may be all termed agglomerated enclosures elsewhere, or, are very distinctive. Um, the only one of these that's been investigated is at Dalton Hall's, and that's had a, a villa superimposed upon one end of it. It's an Iron Age, a series of Iron Age enclosures, incrementally created. Um, and interestingly, the, the one at Bramall Park is also had. Uh, an interpretation of the villa composed upon it, although there's no excavation to confirm that. It, uh, it now forms part of the car park to the Leeds Festival, unfortunately. And as rendered geophysical survey impossible. <laughs> we tried it. <laughs> it didn't work. The one site of this type which isn't here is the one that I showed you in some of the early pictures, which is the example at Waddle site near Willoughby. <coughs> uh, that has been excavated to a great degree uh, to facilitate uh, a new relief road at Willoughby, the um, on site the A1. Interestingly, the phasing for that site shows the enclosures to be developed as a probably over three phases, in fact two mainly. Originally we have an Iron Age settlement that uh, is formed as a, a, a washing line settlement along uh, a, a meandering or sinuous ditch, several phases of these enclosures. And then later on in the earlier Roman period, but probably still effectively native Iron Age approach to uh, agriculture, we have a the bolt-on uh, enclosures which give it a more typical look of the, uh, the enclosure group. Now the big, the big um, surprise for this site was in fact the final phase where all the field systems and enclosures had gone out of use. And the final phase was made up by an open settlement of late Roman sunken floor buildings. Um, reconstructed here. These are a total, totally unknown in this area, um, although there are perhaps more sunken floor buildings represented in the data than we originally thought. I'll come back to those in a slightly later. The other thing about the Bottle Site site was it reinforced a growing impression about how stone was used. We tend to think of these crop mark sites as being ditch and earthworks, probably timber palisades and things like that. But on the aggregate bearing geology, the stone was used. Maybe not to a great degree, but the Bottle Site, we had quite a lot of evidence for stone revetment around the basis of, of the banks. Um, here, this is down at Ferry Bridge, stone revetments, bolstering a ditch where it was cut through an earlier phase of ditch. And we also we found this at sites of Barnstone Park. And it's interesting to note this in, in the context of what Paul Buckland said about this site of Marfick Wood in 1980. He wrote that in the 1960s that site could be seen, which was, could be seen as upstanding walls. And now, in 1980, all that you can see was the crop mark. Um, who knows what you can see now, if anything. But it's, it's obviously really something, some serious truncation. 
So it's not just these, these bits of walls we should be thinking about. It should be we should be thinking about our upstanding um, elements to these, these structures, to these, uh, these supplements. To address the, um, the actual field systems themselves now, the one on the, one on the right is obviously the classic brickwork as defined by Derek Riley. Uh, this is a more, <coughs> I would call it a mixed field system, typical of the, the northern limestone areas. These are what we find generally on the southeastern sandstone and south of the Don. What this was clear here, what we're trying to show here, is that the different elements that make up the field systems are common everywhere. It's just the, the, the predominance of them that give you the impression of what, what type of field system it is. And interestingly, when we plot those areas of predominance, clearly the, the yellow, which is the, uh, the brickwork type fields, do predominate in the areas where variety was finding them. But they're not restricted to that area. They are found in patches all the way up the limestone as well, particularly in these two large plateau areas near Aberford and Boston Spa. And the, the, fact, the factor in here seems to be large flat areas. But not just large flat areas, <laughs> large flat areas that were devoid of trees other obstacles that enable you to lay out large systems in one go, visually sight them. And we know that the limestone in this area was cleared of trees very early on in the Iron Age, and possibly on the on the levels even earlier. The, uh, the, the green areas of mixed field systems they're the areas which probably conform to the original model I talked about, these the bleeds, where you, the tree clearance is not as great, but areas that keep, are, are taken in incrementally to expand the system. They're areas where the, the, the limestone is more rolling and you, you get a more piecemeal effect for the field system. This is all the crop mark data plotted against the limestone. And of course, the adjacent coal measures and the Sherwood sandstone. What's very noticeable is that while the crop marks are very dense on the limestone to the north of the Don, they're virtually absent south of the Don, which explains why people in South Yorkshire have always talked about the limestone not having much archaeology on it. And the same goes for North Nottinghamshire. It's always been a bit of a puzzle to me because I've always found the limestone to be the most richest part of West Yorkshire. But why should this be the case? Well, if you look at the topography, it's quite clear. It's a topographical factor that's at play here. It could, be the, it could just be one factor, but it seems to be a very key factor. One other possibility here is the, the clearance. We don't think that there's so much tree clearance from, from what records there are. We don't think there was much, as much early tree clearance on this high limestone. There's also a, a, a soil issue. The soils are renowned for being very thin um, and very dry. It's a hydrology problem. There's no rivers that run through this area, so it's very difficult to irrigate. And we think probably what's happened here is, that in preference, these areas of the adjacent uh, sandstone have been exploited because these areas are effectively marginal to the early farms. So these are naturally the places where uh, they've, been, uh, they've been preferentially exploited. And even in these, you can see from the, from this plot here that the, the, the tendency for the, for the early brickwork fields to, to occupy the a slightly higher ground, not much higher, that's been exaggerated, but they, they, they knew enough to, to put them on the, the better drain land around the edge of the Humber Head Level. And interestingly, this is, these are exactly the routes that the Roman roads took when they first entered into um, 
is part of Yorkshire. It took the higher, the, the higher ground, it skirted around the Humber Head levels, and of course, cut across any field systems that were in their path, because naturally they were heading towards the, the, the fords that had been used in the Iron Age, um, natural fording places. Uh, this is the site of the Osterfield site that Derek Riley originally pointed to as being a um, field system with the enclosures cut through by the Roman road, which led him to draw the conclusion that the, these field systems were pre Roman. We can now show from a more broader study that this is not a unique situation. In fact, there is nowhere in the study area where a Roman road can be plotted and where a Roman road can be seen to be plotted against the field system that the field system actually reflects the Roman road. But, um, the Roman road always seems to cut across at angles, it seems to be a later feature, and there's never any attempt to realign any field systems with the Roman road. That's not to say there aren't later Roman field systems, there are. These field systems as evidence for them carrying on in use, but they've obviously just accepted the road and worked around it. There are Roman field systems such as places like Armford where they will be laid out um, within the Roman period. And it's just because there's no Roman roads in those areas that we don't appreciate that they're, um, that they're contemporary uh, nature. at the Roman sites, a general picture of the Roman sites. Um, the Roman, I'm not going to go into detail on the Roman sites here, it's just not the time. The important thing here about is the, is the talk about is the road system, which generally speaking, we, we didn't revise to any great degree, although we, we tweaked some of the, the routes, the journeys. There's two key things to note here. One is the evidence for a Roman road between Templeborough and, well, everybody was looking for a route between Templeborough and Castleford or Templeborough and Grey Boys. And out of fact, they have a stretch of Roman road at South Dunsel which suggests that the road in Templeborough <coughs> actually crossed the Wend at Fort Borden and joined the 28B to run up to Castleford there. So that was quite an interesting <laughs> revelation. The other new bit of information was the discovery of a, a Cockmark Fort at Long Sandal. Now, not long ago, um, a fort was discovered on the air at Roll, and this um, provided some evidence for the, um, for the control of the river system leading into the Humber. We now have another one at Long Sandal, which um, shows that uh, the same is happening on the Don, just to the north of Doncaster. And of course, this now gives meaning to the uh, to the to the Roman road, um, Roman road two eight one, generally known uh, uh, as the, the Cantley Spur. Before it was uh, unexplained as to why that road went there, you know, people were looking for it carrying on the other side of the river. In actual fact, it turned out to the fort. Now, I've given this talk, similar talks, a few times now, and never before have I been able to say that the study area has revealed anything about the post-Roman landscape, the early <coughs> post-Roman landscape. It's only recently I've begun to see that the poss there's possibilities here for, for, um, for understanding this a little bit better. The the study area is full of little rectangular crop marks, like this. There's quite a lot of them. Um, so I've started plotting them now <coughs> to see where they, they, how they group and where they, they focus and what the distribution overall is. These three are actually at Leadstone, and that one is excavated as part of an evaluation for a new. Uh, mineral extraction 
condition to it actually didn't come off. And because it didn't come off, this, 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 this feature didn't get dug. But what it is, is a, it's a sunken floor feature, um, typical Bruggen house style, with the axial posts. But we only excavated one quarter of it, and it had a little step inside ledge, which I have not seen anything like this anywhere. And I asked to consult with Helen Hammer on this, and she hasn't seen anything like it anywhere either. So it's possibly unique the country, um, time will tell. The one interesting thing is that we actually found um, the remains of a human child in, in the centre, um, which suggests it could be a form of mortuary house. Makes it more unusual, but that's been great. We did actually recover some bones radiocarbon out to the 5th, 7th century. Now, I don't propose that all the rectangular features throughout the study area and beyond our old 5th, 7th century sunken floor and mortuary structures. Because so I, I am now realising that some of them are look very similar to crop marks on, say, the sunken floor buildings that have been excavated with Don Paul. So the chances are they are all sunken floor buildings of some description and possibly not all the same period and not all the same function. So I think it's an interesting development. Of course, we can say something about the post-Roman archaeology in terms of the medieval period and its crop mark. Uh, it's um, rich and furrow, and this is what is in this plot of the rich and furrow um, regimes that have been recorded. Now, most of these here are a product of post-medieval uh, Plowing up off the, off the, on the head levels that recovered from flooding. The interesting thing is, though, is that there's hardly any ridge and furrow <coughs> showing down the limestone. The, the spine of the limestone is almost devoid, and this is the very area where it's a breadbasket of the, the Roman period, and you'd expect there to be ridge and furrow. And the reason why it's not there is because it's been lost to modern plowing. We know for a fact from <coughs> records and from fossilised field systems where you can see the reverse S of, of, of the ridge and furrow regimes, they were there. These are green areas of ridge and furrow. You can see that the ridge and furrow areas actually dictated the later enclosure, but there's actually no correspondence with the early Iron Age and Roman field systems. I think people may claim that one you know, ditch here and there corresponds, but generally we're talking about a totally different regime of, it, of landscape exploitation. And we don't know the process of how that happened. It's, we're getting the idea now that some of the late Roman field systems continued right into the 5th century, but that then just pushes on the problem. We, don't, we still don't know what happened when the transition really took place to the open field where the, the, there was the abandonment of, of, the, of, the, of the ditch field systems. We do have a cycle of enclosure, open field enclosure. So truncation is a big problem. And I think I'd like to talk a bit about the quarrying industry, especially as this is a project qualified for funding by virtue of the, the mineral extraction in the area. The quarry industry does play a big part in our investigations because there's been a lot of um, bad press about mineral extraction, um, particularly around Thornborough, about how, how, how it shouldn't happen. And it's got to happen because the reserves in this area are required for the, the economy of the country. So it's going to have to happen. But the reserve, some of the reserved areas are going to take out some of the um, more interesting parts of the landscape. It's a reserved area just near, near Harworth. Fact is, we don't even know that these field systems still exist. They were recorded in the 1970s. When it actually comes to digging quite a lot of these brickwork fields and other things on the limestone, they barely survive. <coughs> the other factor is that a lot of the work that's taken place in this region 
has, has come together as a result of things road schemes. Now, road schemes are probably once a generation things. They're not going to happen every 10 years. You're going to get one, one a generation, maybe, if you're lucky. Probably not even that. The quarrying industry, in the meantime, when it comes out of recession, it's going to get back. When it gets back on its feet, it's going to be taking out large parts of the landscape on a regular basis. If they, it's probably mitigated now, and I think the, the quarry industry is our best hope for understanding these landscapes. Because if they enable us to test our, our theories, to develop them, to investigate the sites over the short term, because it's the short term that these sites have. They do not have years to exist. This is the site of a Bronze Age site of Pokemore, where the, you can see the depth of the plow soil is very shallow. There's virtually nothing left. In fact, there is nothing left in places. Some of these features are not existing now. This is the Roman road at Bramham, having recently excavated. This is the crop mark coming in. There is the a good geophysical response to the Roman road. That geophysical response is by virtue of that field being pasture. In the arable field, to the east, nothing was seen. The only thing that remained were the borrowed pits that must have formed the agar. And they have virtually little left in them either. So it's the short term, I think, for these landscapes, or well, certain parts of them anyway. And hopefully, this uh, lecture has given you an insight into some of the questions that still need answering. Thank you. It's our convention now to invite questions, and Ian will take them as a group and answer. But I will see it as something of an encore, as it were, mm -hmm. as a mini essay, just to sum up some of the things that have been said and the audience reaction. Um, so, please, some questions for our speakers tonight. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, and that was, that was fascinating. I was, um, with a couple of things, just uh, uh, I excavated an infant burial in a some building at Warren Percy that was a radiocarbon data sent out, etc., mm -hmm. that might provide a path to your Hurston uh, one. But I wanted to ask uh, about the uh, whether you had any uh, later crop mark evidence for the sort of butterwick type enclosures we see on, on the walls of the sort of uh, uh, eighth uh, and, and so on, and whether any of the circular enclosures that you said were. were uh, uh, were cut through by rectangular field systems could actually be later than the, the, the rectangular systems. Mm. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Please. Yeah. Um, I've looked at the dating evidence from a lot of these field systems recently, and it seems to be very striking that, um, as far as pottery is concerned, there isn't a great deal that comes from these ditches whether from the Lydia limestone or indeed on the sandstone, which is later than the late second or early first century. And I wonder whether you had any view on that, whether that is, whether that impression, you confirm that impression, but also, that being the case, what sort of agricultural regime is taking place afterwards? Is it simply to landscape the band, or is it being divided up in a different sort of way, or is it all around in a different sort of way? It does seem, as I say, it seems very striking that the amount of late Roman pottery coming from many of these fields very, very limited, very limited indeed. Any more questions? Yes, please. Um, does your work here, particularly in the West Yorkshire area, does it render obsolete or supplement my copy of the West Yorkshire survey that we've done yeah. some 30 years ago? <laughs> John, yes. Um, I've got two actually. Uh, I was interested in your uh, distribution map of the um, Neolithic, uh, the Neolithic monuments and the Neolithic finds, and it sort of disappeared from the screen before I could really have a good look at it. But it looked just fleetingly as though the, the Neolithic finds looked almost 
mutually exclusive to the monuments. There were areas where there were Neolithic finds and there were areas where there were monuments, but they didn't sort of overlap. And the second one was, I was intrigued by your um, slide which showed the Winkle Bank Fort and those ditches that were sort of going off from it. And the shape of that sort of funnel shape there. Well, I've seen that in, on other, in other sort of landscapes on much smaller scales those tend to be interpreted as sort of um, funneling devices to get animals, you know, herded in. But on that scale, I think the banks would be yeah. sort of like a kilometre apart at the widest point. So I just wanted to see what the scale was on, on yes. that, which would be huge. OK, and I think uh, you've got plenty there to fit with either two. Thanks to our audience. <coughs> <laughs> I'll go with them in the order they came, actually. Mm. I, I was aware of the burial of Warren, but only just uh, read the report. So, but, but, yeah, but yeah, thanks for bringing that out. So I, I didn't know whether it would sound as though it was a proper parallel, mm. but it, it may well be. Uh, I only looked at the, the figure so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, Later crop mark evidence. The problem is we don't really know how late some of these crop marks are. There's a problem with dating them because we've been reliant upon the pottery, um, cut off of the pottery, but we don't know how long the pottery stays in use. So it's a bit of a problem there. Um, I take the point about a lot of the pottery in the ditches dating to the second and third centuries. That, 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 that does seem to be the case. And I think a lot of that's to do with the fact that a lot of the pottery in this region tends to come from the county kilns, which were operating at their height in the second and third century. So naturally, you get a glut then. But the other, the other later pottery does exist. I mean, the, the sunken buildings at Wattle Site were full of the fourth, early fifth century pottery. But I think we get less of it away from the main settlements. And the problem is it's finding the later settlements. So as I said, we've been looking for different things, I think, in the past. Um, we haven't been looking for sunken floor structures. Um, and focusing upon enclosures. And enclosures tend to be high nature and early Roman. So I think there's a bias in the record now. Uh, because we didn't know what, what to look for. Certainly, I think by the time we get to the villa economy, you should be looking at enclosures. Uh, only volume one, Phil. Um, <laughs> I'll have to buy a new one. <laughs> now, I think um, it was inevitable, I suppose, that something written in 1981 when barely any field work had been done by Stuartia and uh, where the original, I think the 1976 site at Leadston was it. Um, and that focused upon a very atypical site, which only recently a parallel has been found at Nickelfield in, in the A1M country. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is so much work that I can't really yeah. Yes, the distribution of fines. It's an odd one, that one. We didn't really find a great... We, we excavated quite thoroughly around the, the, the Furbridge mm -hmm. end where the, the A1 was diverted. I don't think we found a lot of Neolithic material. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Neolithic sites were actually anywhere near the Henge. Mm -hmm. We didn't excavate inside the Henge. So I suspect it's only the Neolithic materials we had it, it didn't have. Right. But maybe there's a big exclusion around the hangs of Neolithic activity. Um, I wouldn't rely too much on the distributions mm. we've got. Uh, we would be relying upon identifications that existed in the seminars and historic environment records. We couldn't authenticate them. But um, that's an interesting one. And I think, uh, I don't know if the former of Van Harding had a similar. Did he find uh, 
Yeah, that's right. I'm going to try. He's a little bit.